Welcome back to Season 6 of the Interwoven Podcast. In today's episode, we welcome back therapists Caitlin Walsh and Cherie Kett for an open conversation about the journey through infertility. Rebecca, Caitlin, and Cherie talk about the hidden emotions women experience, including the stress, anxiety, and strain it can put on a partnership. They share the importance of knowing the isolation and burden that women carry in this process, and the illusion around the ease of fertility. Join them as they share what they see professionally and what they experience personally. This August, Interwoven is presenting a screening of the documentary Periodical by Lina Leopolite. This groundbreaking film highlights the challenges and stigmas surrounding the menstrual cycle. Stay tuned for more details during this episode. Thanks for being with us today. Enjoy the episode. Hi, Shereen and Caitlin. We are really excited to have you both back on the podcast and are grateful you are willing to jump in to this conversation somewhat last minute. This season, we've been discussing intimacy and sexual health and had our lineup guests set up and everything recorded and realized that there was an important conversation that was missing. And as an acupuncturist who has specialized in fertility for almost 18 years and then had my own six-year journey with infertility, I see and know the challenges that for infertility in particular can present for couples when it comes to everything, but in particular intimacy and sex and how then that adds more stress and anxiety to the journey of trying to build your family and maintain a healthy relationship with your partner. So we're we're excited to have you here and to talk more about that because it is a really important conversation and one that I think a lot of people don't really talk about. And so across the board, infertility can be really isolating. And it's really hard when that isolation also feels like it's happening with your partner. Yeah. Yeah. I guess before we jump in, could each of you introduce yourselves again um, and the work that you do? My name is Caitlin Walsh. Um, my practice is called Caitlin Walsh Counseling. I focus mainly on anxiety and how anxiety impacts women through the different stages of their life and also how it impacts their relationship, their relationship to others, their relationship to themselves. I also have a focus in grief and um, a focus in self-esteem and just how anxiety plays a part in, in those areas. My name is Shri, and I have a private practice specializing in sexual health. So I work mainly with women. I do some couples as well around sexual function and relationship, kind of like you said, Caitlin, with self and others and their partner, but also seeing kind of sexuality from a very like holistic perspective of your physical, emotional, spiritual, mental self, not just kind of this thing you do. Yeah, I would say like most of most of my clients are individual women. Again, thank you for being here. I know from my own personal experience how difficult infertility can be and that across the board it's not something that we talk about enough. And certainly, especially when the fertility journey lasts much longer than you expect out the gate, how that can have such an effect on your relationships across the board friendships and partnerships and even with family, right? But just the impact that it can have on mental health, as well as the strain that it puts on sex and intimacy. From, again, my own experience, how it's hard to look at all of those pieces of things and not feel sort of the stress and anxiety of trying to navigate trying to maintain a relationship while you're also tracking your cycle and trying to initiate because it's that time of the cycle. Yeah. How often does it come up in the work that you do? How often are you seeing women or couples with infertility? And how does the conversation maybe differ a little bit from some of the other people you work with? I would say that, you know, it comes up pretty often in different forms that sometimes women are coming to see me because of that and the intimacy part relating to fertility. But sometimes it's processing past grief that they've maybe gone through that and 
they're on the other end of it or the other side and wanting to go back and process something or it's like endometriosis or having a full hysterectomy or processing that or um, even sexual function stuff around like vaginismus or a partner with erectile function issues. So there's a, like, I think a lot of different ways and iterations it comes up, but it is very, I would say often in yeah, my experience. Sometimes, you know, are, are generally anxious, right? That's my focus. And so I will notice it might not be the first thing they come in like four in terms of infertility, but I have a group of younger women or women who are just starting out their journeys with pregnancy and motherhood. And I will notice that because if they're challenged with anxiety, it's like the perfect storm uh, for anxiety. Because when we think of anxiety, it's usually like, it's usually either forward or back. And one of the things that makes anxiety much, much worse is not being able to, you know, it's like it's in the future, we can't control it. And so it's like this perfect swirling storm of something you're hoping for and something you're wanting and all you do is ruminate about it. So rumination is going to be like the the big challenge with anxiety. And it's like, that's like the the perfect, you know, storm of challenges. So, you know, when someone, your therapist is like, okay, we're going to try to not ruminate about this and you've been wanting it your whole life, that's going to be a challenge. So usually my patients don't necessarily come in to see me for that, but if they are within those years of childbearing, even if they have zero challenge with getting pregnant, it's usually a conversation that we have. They're all worried about it. I don't know if it's, I've had, I think every single one of my childbearing age patients will come in and we'll have several conversations about their worries about it, what's going on with it. And then, you know, a fair amount of them have had challenges with it because it, it, it is, you know, does come up quite a bit. And so it's like my patients, it doesn't necessarily like it's whether or not they have it or not, they still worry about it. And I find that is so true, the control piece of things. And it's such a double-edged sword, right? Because it's like, oh, you want to let go of control, but also you need to track basically every detail of your cycle, right? So it's such a difficult space to be in. And I I tell women all the time, so my I would say my practice is 90% fertility and then pregnancy and menopause. But I tell women all the time, like we are used to as women, the harder we work for something, that, you know, we make things happen, we get things done. And infertility is one of those things that it doesn't work that way. And unfortunately, sometimes the more we ruminate on it, and the more we try and control it, the more difficult the journey can be because we don't have control. And unfortunately, for a lot of pieces of the puzzle, there isn't one answer, right? Like we want often to like figure out what's the one thing that's going to fix it all. And sometimes there is, sometimes there can be a clear cut answer or diagnosis for what's going on. But the mental health piece of that puzzle and the anxiety and stress of it all, even without then trying to add sex and intimacy with your partner on top of that is a lot, right? Yes. And I don't know if you experienced this, Rebecca, but I did like, there's a fair amount that's unknown. And so we want these controlling, like we really want an answer. And, you know, there's a fair amount that is sort of up in the air. And I've had doctors say that to me, even like, oh, we're not even really sure. So for somebody who has anxiety, you know, that can be really hard. Or if like something works for one of their friends or like for me, I actually did do acupuncture for a little while for my second daughter. And that was super helpful. But like I've had friends who, you know, they've had, you know, bigger challenges with it or, you know, just the pieces weren't all fitting together. So like when there's not a clear cut, like this is going to work, you know, it's like your anxiety, everything can just be like out of, out of control because there isn't actually a, always a clear cut answer or challenge. It's just, we don't totally know. And that's not very comforting, right? Or helpful. Yeah. And I think too, right, it's like, even if I see this a lot in my practice, so I'm wondering what you both see in yours, even if the issue is male factor, which they say 40% female, 40% male-ish, and 20% is probably that unexplained or a little bit of both situation when looking at causes of infertility, is that even if it's male factor, which again, it can be 40% of the time, it's often the female partner 
who ends up in our office for acupuncture. So I wonder too, you know, I think as as women, because it is sort of our body and we're tracking our cycle, the burden also often falls on us to sort of navigate the whole landscape and then try and help our partner to get the right supplements or get the care they need. But, you know, I think we talk about that a lot, even let's say in motherhood, but like, or, you know, as sort of this invisible load of womanhood, right, is like oftentimes in infertility too, I find that a lot of that falls on the woman to sort of navigate all of that, which is also really anxiety producing. Absolutely. So this season of the podcast has really highlighted for me how many of us were fed also this idea that intimacy and sex just happened. And I know, Cherie, we talked about that and how communication is so important and, and that it doesn't just happen and shouldn't just be easy and that it's about connecting with yourself and connecting with your partner. And we grew up on movies that, you know, where there's a spark and we meet our soulmate and live live happy ever after. When in reality, these things take work and communication. And then you throw life in like infertility or a variety of different things that can come up in particular in early marriage. You know, if if a couple is sort of setting out and and I see a similar dynamic at play when it comes to fertility because we spend most of our young adult lives trying to prevent pregnancy. And we were given, and it's interesting, Caitlin, that you say that you feel like most of your patients seem to have sort of anxiety about their fertility. And so it's interesting, right, how we each also as practitioners have sort of this pool or pocket of people that make up our reality of patient bases, right, or of of patient experiences. Um, I think that we were given this impression that getting pregnant is easy and that I remember when I was younger, like the whole, like, you could get pregnant if you like go in a hot tub. Like, do you remember that from when you were (laughs) younger? And when in reality, it's like, even if everything is perfect, if sperm meets egg, if the timing is perfect, if everything is right, and someone is, is a very fertile person, as women, we are only the chance of conception in a given cycle for women under 30, and that's less when, you know, as we age is only to 25 to 30% per cycle. And we're only fertile for maximum five days of a cycle. And that's because sperm lives for maximum five days. Egg lives for about 48 hours from when it's ovulated. So we maybe were taught this in health class, but we certainly like for most of us, a lot of us, that was years ago, if it was really covered in a way that one would remember. And so I feel like a lot of women and couples go into the trying process sort of at a disadvantage because they don't necessarily know exactly what's happening with their body hormonally or when they're fertile. And so that then if there is, if it is taking longer than expected, can add so much pressure to a situation that couples often envision being fun. I feel like with most of the women I see when they come in, they're like, oh yeah, kind of the first six months or the first year, the first three months, whatever it is, you know, we just decided we were going to have fun. When we think of sex and intimacy and our partner and, and oh, like I can actually like, we're going to have sex without birth control, right? Or whatever the case is, like you're, you feel like you're entering into this new chapter that feels exciting because for the first time in your life, maybe you're with a partner where you are wanting to get pregnant. And that's a different space than yeah. you've been in in your life thus far. When it doesn't happen, I think people can feel blindsided. Yeah. Yeah. That whole match, nat- it should be natural and easy is a really a big setup in many regards, right? Because when, when it's not, then what the messages are of, well, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with us? shame then growing. And sometimes that isn't, again, creates distance and disconnect and lack of touching amongst couples, right? And so that that is a really important one, I think, even before some of this even begins, even I think going back into like sex ed, right? How we teach about even how pleasure is completely left out of sex Mm -hmm. ed altogether. And it's very much the emphasis on procreation and how babies are made, but also tends to be almost in a fear-based bent, like just don't do this. <laughs> and not there's not any scaffolding for what to do or what to, how to feel. So when it's not natural and easy, it becomes very laden with almost the shame and the failure, sense of failure. And that's what I think too, I work 
a lot on with people in a general sense is that sexual shame and how that sometimes, and then how that looks, particularly when it comes to fertility is almost like the, what are the building blocks that kind of even creates how that, like almost the perfect storm image, right? That you use, Caitlin. Mm -hmm. And I think to really context matters so much and to think about what is the context that a woman or a couple finds themselves in at this time. And it's going to be different than maybe when they first got married or before they got married. And even now in this context, maybe of childbearing and trying to have children. And when, like you said, when that's not easy or natural, or it's it's the spontaneous, like this idea, like maybe how it was taught makes this sense of like, well, you're just going to, it's you're going to get pregnant if you go anywhere near a penis and a vagina, go anywhere near each other. And so I think too, that it's not just spontaneous. It doesn't just always, it doesn't just happen. And so how, helping people kind of say, what is this context and how to, what does this new context and this, this reality mean for you? How to hold yourselves, how to hold yourself and also the relationship too within that context of maybe yeah, trying to have children and it being difficult. Mm-hmm. I do think people have this impression that relationships are supposed to be easy. <laughs> and if they're not, and I mean, any, any part of a relationship, if they're not, then there's a problem. And I mean, so I work a lot just in general with patients to, to sort of normalize that, like every relationship is going to be hard. Like it's a lot yeah. of work. If you see some couple that seems happy, like they've really worked at it. It's not just like people plop into the world and are just like meeting their perfect match and it's just seamless and nobody works at anything. Like I think the people that seem most well matched, they've probably worked really hard at it. Right. So like if you do run into like the fertility as a challenge, it's a huge challenge because it's got all these elements. I I just always think about it'd be hard pressed to find a couple that like feels exactly the same about having kids. So then you usually have this mismatch. One person is usually maybe more like connected to it. And then so then that mismatch can just start to grow. And then, you know, pressure (laughs) is like the opposite of. A, sexy, and then B, you know, connectedness. And I just think the challenge every month, especially for the women that I I work with, is like the pressure just grows and grows and grows. And you mentioned shame. And it's like all those things coupled together just, I think, turn into this like horrible knot of challenge when you're trying to do something that like most people, you know, have probably thought about for a long time and really wanted it to be a certain way. And whenever we have that in the mix too, where it's like this idea of what it should be and it's not matching up to that, you know, it's like, that's, that's really hard. And so, yeah. And I don't think people get much support with it, honestly. You know, I had a doctor tell me after I had like three or four miscarriages to just go again and come back if it happened again, like that was their that was their advice. And I was like, that just doesn't seem right. <laughs> you know, like, It's not yeah. right. I had, and like, all the emotional, it's almost like that it's being so- seen just from a physical function perspective totally. versus all of the emotional and the mental yep. um, aspects of that experience. Right. And, and just like flat affect, just like, well, we're not going to, do- let's just wait and see. We're not going to do anything we'll see if it happens again. And I had to like go find, I think I talked to you, Rebecca, I talked to several other therapist friends about like what other people did. And I kind of investigated on my own, got some different support, changed doctors. <laughs> but like, you know, that it's like, I don't think women get much support when they're, and I didn't even, not that I want to compare to like whose challenge is worse, but like in general, I didn't have a super long, like arduous, six years, you know, it wasn't like that, but it still was quite challenging. And I didn't know what was going on. And I was surprised because it was my second child. And I didn't have that problem with my first, (laughs) you know, I was just older. And so, yeah, I think, I mean, I remember too, when I like having some friends too, with that, I hadn't had kids at the point, this point, but a couple of friends who had had some, a couple of miscarriages, and one of them really didn't want anybody to know. Yeah. And the reason was because she, she I mean, I w- she didn't say this explicitly, but it was almost like the blame that what did you do that you did something like you maybe danced at a wedding or something or you or like, like or, that's how right, I felt or unhealthy. Right. Or it's like older. there's yeah. very much that place of 
how, and, and then I think we, where is this, what's the system? And I, I often say like, there's the patriarchal system. That's like how women are in relationship with their own bodies or how we're kind of already protected to like gear up for being blamed for something that keeps these things often very like isolated too, where we don't maybe know how to even ask for support or talk about reaching out or, Um, We think, oh, this is just how it should be that we have to kind of muscle through and kind of just go through this pain by ourselves. And especially if your doctor basically says that to you, right? You're like, and and I having my background in therapy and stuff was like, yeah, that didn't feel right to me, you know? And so I decided to do that. But like, I'm, I don't think, I think lots of women would hear that from their doctor and be like, oh, because it's their doctor, you know? Absolutely. And the thing that's sad is that there are three of us in this conversation and two of us. So I had a very similar situation. I went to my primary care doctor, maybe when we were about a year into trying and he was someone I really liked, uh, you know, prior to this. And was telling him what was going on and and that we were struggling to get pregnant. And his response to me was, oh, well, you know what? My father-in-law was an OBGYN for like 30 plus years. And he would just tell his patients to go home, drink a bottle of wine and have fun and it will happen. Great. And I left. Uh, to this day, I wish I would have said more. I wish I would have. I wish I would have said more because I knew that it was not right. And this was a medical professional. He should have known better. His response was dismissive at best and quite honestly negligent. When we tell women who are, whether they're experiencing debilitating periods or are not getting pregnant after a year of trying or have had more than one to two miscarriages, when we tell them that it'll just be okay or that they just have to kind of grin and bear it, um, or women who are in their late 30s or 40s and are having symptoms that line up with perimenopause and they're being told they're too young or that's not possible. Like I just had someone tell me that, that they were told to sort of roll with it. That's not okay. And yeah. it delays a potential diagnosis and treatment. And it's, as yeah. you can tell, something that really yes. like, it shouldn't be happening, right? I mean, yeah. really, it's kind of medical gaslighting because yeah. it's your health and your care. And those aren't helpful in that situation. Yeah, I think it's really important that you're emphasizing that it's not okay. And I think that's what I hope a lot of the listeners really hear. Because I think when I work with women, when I say those things, I think they've normalized some of those messages for so long. And that those things they hear from medical professionals in different settings lands in that normalizing place that they've just been like, oh, this is just how it is. And it's, it isn't okay. And I often, I I use this example, like in some ways, like when we're actually putting a new roof on our house, like we get quotes from different roofers. I think the same is true when it comes to different professionals and different doctors. If there's a doctor that you get this icky feeling, like, or like you said, Caitlin, like that just didn't sit right with you. I really like when I'm working with people in that advocacy piece, it's really like paying attention to that reaction that you have and listening to it. And if it if you feel like you need a new provider, like it's okay to go somewhere else to get that care because some of that advice, we need to interrupt that cycle and that system of it's okay and this is just normal and this is how it, how it is. And we'll be right back. Interwoven is excited to present Periodical, a groundbreaking documentary by director Lina Leoplite that examines the science, politics, and stigmas of the menstrual cycle. Join us August 21st at Next Act Theater for a reception starting at 6 p.m., the film screening from 6.30 to 8 p.m., followed by a panel discussion featuring Interwoven's Rebecca Jankowski, Representative Robin Vining, Nicole Dox, co-founder of Period Parties and a volunteer with Milwaukee Diaper Missions Period Program, and Dr. Emily Lombard. OBGYN. Proceeds benefit the Milwaukee Diaper Missions Period Program, and filmgoers will enjoy 20% off a visit to Bavette La Boucherie and Cafe Corazon that evening. For more information and to purchase tickets, go to our website, www.interwoven.com. That's I-N-T-E-R-W-O-V-X-N.com. And we hope to see you there. And then, of course, there's the pressure to perform while having sex, be what you want it to be for you as a couple, which is so hard. 
And I see some couples and they are regularly having sex multiple times per week. But for many of us, I'll say myself included, um, when we were in the process, kind of given the busyness of life and maybe differing libidos and the way in which infertility in particular can damper the mood, I will say, often like some planning is required to ensure you're having enough sex at the right time of the cycle. And so that also I found to be, and I would say my husband would agree to, can be really challenging. And so we kind of found ourselves in this cycle of, you know, generally the recommendation if one is trying to conceive is to have intercourse sort of every other day during your fertile window, which is about a six day window in the lead up and around and during ovulation. And so in tracking my cycle and doing this sort of month in and month out, it just really got exhausting because it started off where I, because I was tracking my cycle, would know sort of that period was coming up. Then because I didn't want to like make it transactional, when we started out, it was sort of like, I felt like okay, well, I'll just try and be the one to sort of like initiate. And it won't be like, oh, hey, it's our fertile window. So now it's time to go, right? Because that's not very sexy. And like, who wants to start sex off that way? Also, like that feels like a lot of pressure on him to now have to sort of like make this happen, right? In And in realizing this, so in the beginning, I took on a lot, I feel like, of that burden of like, okay, well, oh, you know what? I know like, okay, I just got like a positive LH stripper or, oh, you know, again, we're talking about fertility on a podcast. So like, you know, cervical mute, whatever, all of the signs of sort of the impending fertile window. And then on top of that, in top of, on top of the stress of kind of tracking and figuring out sort of where we were at and things and temperature charting or whatever it else, you know, all the other things that one can do to kind of see where they're at in their cycle. Then it was also me feeling like I wanted to still try and make it fun or like somehow still have this intimacy and have it not be about just being a transaction. Um, You were like putting in a whole bunch of effort. Yes. Efforting through it. Was not sustainable, right? Right. But you're like, I mean, I don't know that that was really sustainable for more than like, you know, six months, right? Um, And I'm not saying like out the gate of trying, like, you know, you sort of have your rhythm for trying. But once you're like, okay, we think that there, this is not happening. We think that there may be a situation here, right? Or something where you're being more intentional about trying to track and trying to have intercourse at the right time and all of those things. Yeah, like long term for our sex life and our intimacy, it just, it was not sustainable. And, you know, he wanted to support me so much. But Caitlin, you are right, right? Like kind of heading into to trying, it was like, I was already doing the work. So I knew And maybe sort of had a sense that maybe I might have an issue. I'm not really quite sure why. I never had like a diagnosis, but maybe it's just because I had already been working with a lot of women who had challenges. And so when it came time to do it ourselves, I feel like I had way more background where he was sort of like, oh, like I'm not really in a rush. We're not in a rush, right? And so there was some, I think, mismatch there a little bit about maybe the urgency of the situation. Does mental load come into mind? Right. right. It does for me. If for yes. sure. But then because of that, the anxiety, it's like he wanted to support me. I wanted for it to still be fun. And then the longer that went on, it, it felt higher stakes and more pressure. And then neither of us really knew how to best help the other. Totally. Because it's causes it's more like isolation and distance. Right. And yeah. Yeah. The pressure piece. Is- well, even the way like you language that, like he wanted to help me. What is the underlying message, right? The underlying message is that it's you. Yeah. Yes. Right? Yes. That's how we as women, you know, when we were doing that mental load stuff, it's like we as women, we language it in our mind that it's our challenge, whether it's 40% men or 40%, whatever. It's like you take on all this responsibility to like make it fun and like, you know, do all the mental load pieces of it. Of course, that's going to feel super taxing. And not only that, but then we're also sort of like subtly blaming ourselves for everything and having like shame and 
guilt yeah. if it's not fun or if it feels stressful or tension filled, but like, how could it not? You're just, what you're describing sounds incredibly challenging. It's almost like, what if we like, we're like, okay, <laughs> this is gonna suck, but like, let's get into it together. How could we make it work? Right. You know, it's like, you take on all this and my patients too. It's like, as women, we're like, let's take it all on and I'm yeah. going to make this work and I'm going to make it better and I'm going to fix it when yeah. it's like, uh, I don't know. I just think the way you laid that out right there, like that sounds incredibly challenging. I don't know mm-hmm. how it couldn't be, you know, yeah. and then yeah. on you and, like so much yeah. pressure. Yeah. And then he had all this pressure building on his side mm-hmm. too, right? Like of all this, sh- you know, it's like, yeah, all of this. So you're both sort of on opposite. <laughs> you both have these two things going on where the whole in the whole vision of what this whole process is, is you being together, right? You're creating, you know, and so yeah. it is. We need to take, if, if we're having a challenge with fertility and we need to like do this version of sex, it's like we almost need to take it and make it like a different thing. It's not like fun, you yeah. know, sex for fun. It's like sex for babies, right? Like let's make it a different, whole different deal with a different set of circumstances. I don't know. I'm just sort of teasing, but like, it just seems so different in terms of, and we're trying to like put on top of it, the framework of like, oh, but it still needs to be what we used to do, which was like sex for fun. And it's, it's just not. Yeah. Right. It's like this totally different thing. So maybe if, if we changed our mindset around it a little bit, it, it might, and depressurized it a little bit, but I don't even know if that's possible with that set of circumstances. Yeah. I was going to say, Cherie, I'd love to hear your thoughts because to me, it's like when you're in it, it's like you can't really turn off your brain of like, okay, we're in sort of fertile mode here. So we're just going to, it's going to be this here. At least we didn't, yeah. you know, we struggled sort right. of in, in the the process of this. And then like the rest of the time, you know, um, it's hard for it to not sort of pour over totally. the rest of the cycle. Right. And maybe had we known going in, we could have been more, maybe, and again, this is, there was no shame or blame. It just was what it was, right? That like, um, how, how are, yeah. what are ways to sort of ease that burden? Yeah. I think was one of the the things that was one yeah. of my questions of like, if I were giving someone else advice, or if, if any of us were giving someone advice about this journey and how to have communication with your partner and and how to sort of navigate the intimacy piece and try and yeah. maintain that during this journey. What would that look yeah. like? I love what Caitlin said too, of just normalizing that it's just hard. <laughs> like that, that mm-hmm. I think as a starting place. And also, I mean, there's the function piece of wanting to conceive, but there's also like, I think too, just naming what it feels like to have that emotional intimacy and even thoughts and mental intimacy too of what's happening for for each other like the grief and mm-hmm. a lot of these existential places of like holding the uncertainty holding the unknown is yeah. this going to be the time we don't and maybe all that comes with that i have a lot of women who and you know even in my own experience in orgasm just weeping mm-hmm. and people <laughs> women be like is that weird am i is something wrong with me because that's happening I'm like no or even just in this place, sometimes it's just being held, right? Like it might not even be needing to be this the sex that it needs to be for creating babies, but like just to be held and to yeah. cry with one another, right? Or to have the space to be like, yeah, I'm scared. Or I feel like I need to keep this all together. Oh, you feel that way too, right? Like all these things that I think are part of that emotional normalizing together and just also holding that with the part that maybe you want to have happen to create a baby, but also the pieces of where are the places then maybe if it's not the fun for pressure, pressure in that moment sexually, but like, where else are you able then to make fun? Yes. You know, when you're having to do really something really hard, yeah. like it's really that self care and, and the relationship self care, but also the individual self care of just being able to like let loose. And that I think leads into what we're talking about earlier of, women receiving. That's kind of a, maybe an undertone or current that I was hearing as I was hearing what you were talking about of, of us as women, kind of this holding it together, the mental load. I find too, like women really want to know how to be intimate, but part of that too is us letting, like learning to let go 
and learning to not just be the givers, but the receivers yeah. and the ones that don't have to hold it all together. Yeah. And can be, and then this comes into trust and into, can I trust you to hold me? Yeah. Can I yeah. trust you to, you to be, can I trust my heart with you to be vulnerable about what's really going on? Yeah. I think that piece about joy too, a lot of times I'll talk to patients about, and this was one thing like kind of in the middle of our journey, we kind of were like, okay, what does our ideal life look at, look like regardless of the outcome? Whether there yeah. is a baby and a child at the end of it, what does our ideal life look like? And for us, I remember there was an article I read about a, a woman who went through a fertility challenge about buying a white couch and how she had wanted this couch forever and she loved it. But she was like, you know what? I... I'm not going to buy a white couch. We're going to, we want to have a baby. We're trying to get pregnant. And so she kept putting off buying this white couch because it wouldn't, that wouldn't be practical for having a child. And I feel like so often in the women and couples that I work with, but in particular, as you said, Caitlin, sort of women, you know, we sort of take on like, we're going to do this. And it becomes so, and even for myself in that process, it becomes so tunnel vision that you're focusing on all these details and the bigger picture of joy and what life looks like with your partner can be really difficult. Or even women who are like, oh, you know what? I hate my job. But once I have a child, then I'll be able to like switch my career or then then I'll do this. Like once I have a baby or then then this will happen. And it's kind of like, well, what? But what if that doesn't happen? Or what if you did that now? Like what if you if you just kind of open your heart and yourself to like what brings me joy? And what as a couple, and then, you know, expanding that to your relationships as a couple, right? And so I think for us in the middle of it, when things got where all of it just didn't really feel sustainable, that was sort of what we came back to was that we don't know what this is going to look like. And that's a really scary place to be. But also, like, if this relationship, if we are both still in this, and this is but what we both still want and we have to figure out what that looks like. You but know? So you shifted into like what you, you guys could actually control, yes. which is like the life you want. Yes. And you, you know, it's like that's often what I work with with people. It's like, okay, what, what can we control? What can't we control? Oftentimes we can't control a whole bunch, right? And then especially with fertility and stuff. So it's like if we keep grasping at that, that just fe usually feels worse and worse and worse. Yes. We do, especially as a couple, focus on like, well, what kind of, that's so wise that you guys did that because it's like, oh, we actually do get to pick certain things in terms of our yes. life, like what we want to do or where we want to live or like that regardless of outcome, there are things we can go towards that do bring us joy, you know, so that yeah. shift towards like yeah. acceptance and like shift yeah. away from trying to control, yeah. that is often what I, that where yeah. I help people in terms of. Yeah. I love that because there, I think that's something I, I hear a lot too, is how to hold that, like what you're saying too, of stepping into that joy and those decisions of the life that you want regardless. And to say that can be like you're saying is scary because does it mean you're giving up hope or something? And so I think that's like when, with the women I work with too, like how to hold the hope and the longing and also what's happening right now and to live well now, even it, within yeah. that, right? Within that hope and longing. Absolutely. And in that article, the woman ended up buying the white couch and like, <laughs> oh, yes. not pregnant. and the same thing I do feel like for, for us, when we sort of really stripped away all the other stuff and let go of the control and even let go of the way in which in which that child would come into our life. Okay, if this is what we want and like really just sort of like breaking it open to like, these are sort of all of the potential options, but like what resonates with us and where do we connect and what do we, and how can we move forward from here? If this isn't, and I do feel like once that happened, it is sort of like things shifted for us in, in a crazy way. Yeah, so it, it's great and crazy and hard and all the things. And we didn't really even talk about when it comes to like family, friends, coworkers who are experienced infertility and those relationships. Um, but I know we're also yeah. short on time. Oh, yeah. man. I think that part two would be great. Yeah. I'm just so glad to be back here with you both. I love 
when we have had you on the podcast before and have done work with both of you, I just love the direction that the conversation goes. And I feel really comfortable and I enjoy having those conversations with you and having a space to be open and feeling heard and and I always leave being like, yes, yes. Like, Caitlin, when you were like, uh, yes, um, there's the sort of invisible load. Like, yeah, you were right. I was putting a shit ton of pressure on myself yeah. for a really long time, you know? Yeah. And it's interesting to be on the other side of it and to process it with others. It's interesting because it's like now my daughter is almost seven. And so you sort of feel like you kind of like push things down. Like you're, you're like, oh, well, we're over that now. But the reality is that all of those pieces, even from an intimacy and sex perspective, it's still a work in progress because then you add motherhood into the mix. And it's- um, well, And that's not easy either. So if you spent a whole bunch of time wanting this thing and then motherhood or parenthood is really hard. You know, I have a lot of people talk to me about guilt after, yeah. you know, if they do end up having children, you know, it's like I spent all this time wanting this baby or this child and yeah. now I just want to scream at it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I have so much, so many feelings about that. So it's, yeah. you know, it's hard yeah. to reconcile all of that stuff. It's just a lot. Yeah. yeah. And I will say heading into this season, talking about sex and intimacy, Teresa and I are both kind of like, I mean, what are we sort of, what are we getting into here? But yeah. Sheree, I feel like having you on the podcast has made it so easy. Like talking about sex oh, with you is, yeah, like I feel like I just need to start coming. I, I just need to make some appointments and just because, you know, like, um, <laughs> oh, we should chat. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's chat. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, well, I'm so glad to hear that. And thank you for inviting me back on. And it was so fun to, to fun to be here today and talk about this really important topic. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. For me too. I, I appreciate it. It's good to normalize and chat it out. Yeah, I'm grateful. Thanks for being with us for season six of the Interwoven Podcast. For more of our content, including past episodes, the Interwoven Newsletter, and our health guides, visit www.interwoven.com. That's I-N-T-E-R-W-O-V-X-N.com and hit subscribe. With this project, we are creating space for women to share their stories. It's not meant to diagnose or treat a medical condition. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare providers with any questions you may have regarding your health and well-being. This show's copyright is July of 2024. We want to thank our sponsors for their support this season. Special thanks to Gina Barrington for providing the interwoven music. See you next season.